Uh, th thanks very much for the introduction, and it's really great for us both to be here. We're really looking forward to giving this workshop. Um, to start off with, we'd, we'd just like to thank Phil um, for, his, for leading the discussion session this morning on reproducibility. We hope our session this afternoon was going to help build upon that um, and maybe introduce a few tools and techniques that you may or may not be familiar with that, that should hopefully um, allow, take some of the pain out of making our signs actually reproducible. Now, you could, now this, this session is going to be quite different to a lot of the other sessions um, that, that, that's been at the conference, as, as you might be aware. For a start, I mean, there, there are two of us. Most presentations only have one. Um, so the session will be broadly split into two halves. In the first half, I'm going to try and build on some, of the, on some of the things Phil was saying and talk about reproducibility and collaboration in computational science and then introduce um, a lot of the software options that are available to help support these goals as well as briefly demonstrate a couple of the tools we're going to be using later. In the second half of the workshop, my colleague Fergus is going to be walking us through a live demonstration on a toy problem, demonstrating these tools and setting up a pipeline to create reproducible research. Before we go any further, I'd, I'd, just, I'd just like everyone to put their hands up here. Great. Right, I want you to keep your hands up. Hand, 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 hand. <laughs> Thanks, Rafi. <laughs> I want you to keep your hand up if you've ever tried to reproduce another piece of research or another piece of science. Great. That, that seems like everybody. I want you to keep your hand up if you've, ever had any, if, if you've ever had any issues reproducing that science. So you weren't able just to run something out of the box and it worked. Right. I think that's everyone still. Good. We've still got everybody. Right. I want you to keep your hands up if, you, if still after a week of work on the problem, maybe you've asked the author some questions played around, tweaked a few things, it's still not quite worked as intended. OK, we, I think we've lost a couple, but we've still got most hands. Well, I think you'll be pleased to hear that you guys are not alone here. Um, in a survey by Nature in 2016 of more than 1,500 scientists, 90% of them said that to some extent there was a reproducibility crisis. More than 70% of researchers had tried and failed to reproduce somebody else's work. And I think what was most, what was most striking to us was more than 50% reported, self-reported, that they'd failed to reproduce even their own work. Now, this is primarily focused. <laughs> this is primarily focused on obviously experimental work, but I think as as, as we've seen already t uh, today, this definitely applies in the computational setting as well. And but, but but I mean, the field is definitely looking to address this. And one one of the very small things, but that we feel is kind of the start of a coming landslide, perhaps is that so that earlier this year, Nature implemented a code checklist that requires authors to submit any code that is central to the results of their paper. And, and they claim they will be asking reviewers on a case-by-case -case basis to be reviewing the code and checking that it works as, as has been described. So before we go any further, I do just want to just want to touch on what we mean when we say reproducible research. We, we spoke a, bit, a, little bit, a little bit about it this morning, but maybe these will be slightly, slightly different definitions, although I think they match up pretty closely. So Stodden et al. defined five, five possible levels of what you might call reproducible research. The one at the top, reviewable research. I guess you can think of this very similarly to the peer review process. Can you read, can you read a paper, read the methods of the SI, and, and, make a, and, and understand what the authors have done and make a judgment call as to, given the results, whether or not this feels plausible? That has no implications necessarily a priori as to whether that means the research is reproducible, but it's kind of the first smell test. The next level up is, is replicable research. Can, can you take either the code or, or an executable provided by the authors and maybe take their data and just directly reproduce the main, sorry, replicate the main aim or conclusion of the paper? This might be limited in some scope. You might not actually have access to the code or the very rawest stage of the data, but to some extent, you can actually replicate w roughly what they've done. I think slightly orthogonal to that, we would have kind of confirmable research. This is, this is when you can independently write your own code that's not been provided by the authors just by following the methods the SI provided and get 
kind of qu almost quantitatively the same output as was the same output and results that was provided in the paper. And I think the, the two bottom ones are very much similar and kind of encapsulate the other three. So by open and or reproducible research, we, re we really mean that, you, that you've been provided with kind of fully documented, fully documented code and data that is publicly accessible. This allows you to kind of, this allows all of the first three levels of reproducible research to be carried out. You can audit, you can do a full audit of the code and review it and check that it's working as has been described. You can directly replicate by running the code on the data that's been provided, all of the results in the paper. And, for, and, and you can also independently implement a very similar piece of code that can confirm or maybe a slightly different data set that the methods do work as described. And also you can incorporate that code within your project or maybe extend it and, and build upon that research. Do you mind an interruption? Sure, go for it. Um, so just about replicable, I know so there's at least a subset of the reproducible, replicable community who mm. are reserving replicable for kind of experimental replication where you do another experiment and get similar results and reproducible for the code type, the computational reproducibility where you just get the code, mm. run it on the same data and get the same results. So I'm just wondering whether that's a, it, uh, it sounds like that's not what everyone agrees on as a, as a distinction. Then. I think there are definitely multiple definitions out there depending on what people are using, and I think that is one distinction you can make. I think for us, when I refer to replicable, and certainly when they were referring to replicable, they really meant just directly, directly reproducing exactly, be it an experiment computationally or in the lab, using, exact, using exactly the same input, using exactly the same method that you may or may not have access to what's going on under the hood if it's code, you might just have a binary, and you get the exact same output on the other end. Whereas reproducible, kind of, I think we mean it to extend slightly further and be a bit more open and provide a bit more detail. So, there, there, so I suppose that there is also something else that you can think about on that note is, so when we talk about replicable experimental work, you often think about things such as, you know, as, as was discussed in the session earlier, you know, a certain protocol might be very sensitive down to you know, how you stir something, for example. Um, Computational science isn't actually so far removed from that. For example, um, anyone who's familiar with, with uh, molecular dynamics will know that the outcome of a particular trajectory is incredibly sensitive to the initial conditions to the point where simply seeding your random number generator differently can lead to a completely different trajectory. Um, and so in some sense, you have exactly the same problem, albeit in a completely different setting and with completely different ways of addressing it. So the two might not be so distinct as you might first think. Does that help at all? Yeah. I, I, I guess to at least to clarify here what we're using, I think I think there is there is certainly different uses of the words. Thanks. Cool. So I guess one question is why don't people do this already? Why why doesn't everybody push out replicable research? Um, I mean I think we heard some of the reasons this morning, but here was a survey also done by Snowden at NIPS back in 2010 of the top 10 reasons why people didn't either share their code or their data. I think in this session, we're going to focus on maybe specific reasons. Some of them we're not going to try and address. For example, maybe you don't have the legal right to share the code or the, the data owner doesn't want to consent even if you do. Um, but a lot of the other factors here we kind of feel are almost best practice-like um, and also that there are many tools available to help, you, to help you do this in a much more streamlined manner than maybe what was possible before. So now, now we're going to move to describe some of the, some of the tools that can, we can use to help us do this. I've just featured just a few of the available pieces of software or, or workflows that have come out in the past few years that can really help us do this. I guess thematically in the top right hand corner, you've got, you've got kind of your cloud computing um, resources such as Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft Azure. The nice thing about these is they provide a, a very standardized and, and, and replicable environment in a hardware sense quite often for you, for you to play around with. And they also scale very well, all, all the way from a single core up to almost kind of HPC levels of compute power. They're very accessible. Anybody can log on to them. You don't have to already have kind of 50K to buy your own cluster, um, which enables, I guess, a broader range of people to try and reproduce other people's code. It's not just restricted to, say, big players with a lot of, with a lot of resource. In the middle that was mentioned this morning, for example, we've got Docker and Kubernetes that are containerized systems. So what you can do with a container system is if you're a software developer that maybe has produced a, a program, you can package that all together into an executable 
with all binaries, libraries, compilers, everything you need, all within that one container, ship it out, and you'll guarantee that that'll run on someone else's machine. Because in a similar vein, you've got package, ma package and environment management systems, such as Conda, that we'll discuss later. And finally, in the bottom left, you've got code, kind of code sharing and collaborative platforms, such as GitHub and Bitbucket. In this workshop, we're going to provide one, one way, one, one example way in order to kind of string some of these tools together, and we're going to focus on Conda, Jupyter, and GitHub. To discuss these in a bit more detail first, so Conda is an open source package and environment management system. So what this does is you're able to set up kind of virtual machines on your computer where you can install standalone compilers or interpreters and then install any further packages you want within that virtual environment that will be completely standalone and separate from both your system default packages and also any other virtual environment you can create. We're just going to give a very quick demo of Conda in order so that you can see just its power and just how easy it is to use. So say your friend has sent you a very simple Python file and told you to execute it. So we're just going to navigate into the repository where this is kept. Uh, and so the file our friend has sent us is called hello. So we'll just run hello.py. Ah, it breaks. That's not great. That's not a good start. Um, this is obviously, it's only a one-line program here that we're running here. Um, but obviously, you can see, so we could just debug it. Obviously, in a more complicated scenario, you might not have this ability. Um, so we go back to our friend and say, hey, that didn't run. Why not? And he goes, oh, you need to use Python 2. We've obviously got Python 3 installed on our computer. But we luckily have a Conda environment where we have Python 2 installed completely separately from our previous installation. So what we can do is we can simply activate our Python 3.2 environment and then try running again. This, one, this, this piece of software. Seven. Two, seven. Mm. <coughs> ah, sorry. Forgive. We can't reproduce Hello World. <laughs> so now you can see on the bottom left hand corner it says Pi27, which is the name of this environment. And if we now try running our Hello file, we see it nicely prints out as intended Hello Chicago. And then in order to escape out of this environment and get back to our system default, we can simply type source deactivate. This is, this is an environment. Yeah. This is not, the file is not a copy of the file that you had before. So it's not a copy of the file. It's the single same Python file. But we've changed from using our system default installations to go into the environment of our virtual, kind of our virtual environment where we have a different set of software and packages installed in a standalone kind of separate way. So can I just make a comment? I, I'm sure Conda's really powerful, but saying that it's easy to use, I think, is just not my experience. And, and, and meaning you set students to try and use it, and they get all sorts of errors they don't understand. And that's my own personal experience as well. And I could not deal with it. I, I think there's a, you know, a non-trivial bump to get over before you get used to it. I guess when I started using Git, I also found it pretty difficult. And I read a piece of advice which said, use Git for everything, and then you'll get used to it. And, <laughs> and that was true. And I suspect the same might be true for Conda as well, once you've gotten used to it and you use it for everything. I personally have not managed to get over that bump. So I guess I'd say, I'd, I'd say in response that we found it relatively easy for almost the entirety of our group, which is kind of 20-something strong, uses Conda for most for kind of most things, not everything, but it's definitely a very easy way um, to, kind of, to kind, of, kind of do this. I mean, you'll get the chance for yourself if you want to kind of test our Conda package. So later on in the demonstration, we've provided with everyone with a Conda environment that they can install themselves um, on, on their software to kind of test it out. So I guess you can see if with those instructions, maybe it's a bit more but intuitive. That putting Conda on my machine? Because once for example, I put Conda on my machine, all sorts of things changed that I didn't want changing because of things it changed in my .bash RC file without telling me. So I don't know, I, I'm hesitant to. Fair enough. Yeah. So um, something that I also use is the Anaconda Python distribution, yep. um, which comes with a set of graphical tools that also lets you create and manage environments um, and create a whole bunch of you know different um, dependencies. And stuff to run your code in. Mm. And I've found that that's really intuitive for other 
new grad students entering my lab as I like taught them how to uh, use some of those tools? No, I, 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 think, I think we can completely echo that and agree. Like, I think a, a, lot, a lot of us use Anaconda. There's obviously other, other options. Anaconda, for those who aren't familiar, is a kind of a spit. So Conda is the package in, like management system, whereas you've got Anaconda, which is a pre-distributed set of commonly used Python packages within that that, um, as you rightly pointed out, have a few kind of additional nice tips and kind of nice tools for you to use within that. You can install a very lightweight version called Miniconda, which just has kind of the very bare bones essentials. And I, we, we found both very useful, depending on your end needs and how you want it to kind of play nicely with the rest of your, with the rest of your setup. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So I think you both actually raised a, sort of a, a very valuable point there, which is, so for example, you, you point, very rightly pointed out that often new grad students might seriously struggle with, you know, for example, downloading and setting up Conda uh, and then working with manipulating Conda environments. Um, I think this, and you commented on the fact that if you install an Anaconda distribution, you additionally have lots of graphical tools available to you, which sort of make it far more clear exactly what's going on, especially if you're not particularly experience in computer science. Um, I think this speaks to a very broad and almost universal grad student experience, which is, unless you did a software engineering degree, none of us are trained in software engineering. Unless you did a computer science degree, none of us are trained in computer science. You might have scripted some Python before, you might have coded something before, but plenty of people go into PhD programs with little to no computational experience. And we were very lucky in that we received some training not everyone gets that. And so it can be very daunting and very confusing to be thrown into that sort of environment without any sort of formal training. Um, and by no means do I consider something like Conda or Anaconda to be a perfect solution to all of our problems, but I do feel it speaks to the wider problem that even a relatively nice environment can be difficult to work with if you haven't received any systematic formal training. And I feel that that is actually something that the community as a whole really needs to think about how to address because it's not a trivial problem. Thanks, Fergus. Um, so if we move on to the next tool we'll be using today, and this is uh, Project Jupyter. So many of you may be familiar with kind of IPython notebooks before. Jupyter is effective, effectively an extension to multiple language support. Um, so for those who are maybe less familiar with IPython notebooks, so Jupyter is a browser-based interactive environment where you can code in, 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 their, kind of in their notebook format. Um, the notebook format has a few um, very, very big advantages, maybe over a traditional... Um, kind of text editor based system. The first is the ability to intersperse markdown text with, with your code. So markdown provides a really nice, easy on the eye, user friendly way to intersperse comments and explanations of what your code does with your actual code itself. I think the second thing that's really nice about Jupyter notebooks is the cell based environment. So instead of just being one long Python file, for example, you, ha you, you put individual small chunks of code within a cell and then these cells can be run and rerun um, kind of in independently in some sense without rerunning the rest of your code, but still kind of sharing all the variables and all of the packages and other things that have maybe been imported within that notebook. To get a sense somewhat for the like, popularity of this format, there's over 1.7 million public notebooks on GitHub at the moment, obviously not counting any of the private notebooks or the ones just not on GitHub. We're going to ver very quickly demonstrate what a Jupyter notebook looks like just for those of you who aren't familiar. So we're going to use the same example we had before, which is just a very, which is a very simple um, print statement. Um, so you can see already the markdown is very nice. It looks like this before you, before you execute it. But then once you've executed it, it renders obviously very nicely in HTML. So you can add, you can very easily and nicely add comments on your work. And then in this cell, we've just got the one line that we can run. Ah, oh wait, we've got the same issue we had before. So now we can demonstrate how nicely Conda integrates within Jupyter. So you can see up here in the top right hand corner which Conda environment we have running or if it's just your system default. So here you can see again we've got the same problem. We have a Python 3 kernel running. It's very easy within Jupyter just to change your kernel. So we can just change, uh, if I can work the mouse, to the Python 2.7 kernel and then rerun that cell without, without obviously anything really crashing. And here we've got the print statement we want. We could now, if we wanted to, go in and edit what we've typed before and re-execute re that cell and it clears the output from the previous run and prints out the new print statement. Is the output can be used as input for the run? Correct, yeah. So if I defined a variable in this cell, 
I can then do something with it in the next cell. And yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, and you're going to get a much more um, comprehensive demonstration later. Is this is the format that Fergus will be using for the demonstration in the second half. So can I use two kernels in one uh, in one node? No, uh, no, no, you can't. You have to kind of pick and choose which one you execute your code within. When you, when, when we change the kernels, it kind of reset everything, so you don't you don't get that copying across from one virtual environment to the other. So there's a project called SOS scripts of scripts that allows you to run more than one kernel, I believe, in a Jupyter notebook. So you can run. Oh, nice. I, I hadn't had to come across that. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to check that out. Thanks. So the final tool we're going to use, um, or at least kind of in the back end, maybe, maybe give left of a demo of it, is Git and GitHub. So Git is effective, is an open source distributed version control system. We don't have the time to go into version control, but I just do want to comment that it's, it's kind of a bedrock of good, of good programming. And Git tries to take the headache out of a lot of it, although, as has been pointed out already, maybe there is a slight learning curve. But once you get over that, you really don't have to think about it after you're used to using it. And GitHub is a code hosting platform built with Git at its core that is, that is perfectly suited both for version control and collaborative work. There are two key features of GitHub forking and pull requests that really enable these. The first, which is forking, allows you to duplicate either one of your own projects or someone else's project to get a fixed snapshot of, of that piece of source code, whereas pull requests really enable the very large-scale collaborative efforts you see and, and kind of a lot of the very big public libraries are developed on GitHub in this way. For example, things like TensorFlow is all developed. A lot of it's developed through GitHub. And this allows users to write code that extends the functionality of the existing um, software, test it themselves, then submit it to the owners of the project. You can then review it and decide whether or not to incorporate it and merge it into the existing project. We don't really have time to focus much more on either Git or GitHub, but just to note that all of the code for this workshop is available on GitHub. And if we have time at the end, Fergus might sh briefly show some things to do with it. So moving on towards the problem that we're going to use um, for our demonstration. So we'd very much like a lot of you to follow along if you want on your laptop. Um, or if not, um, we do have all the resources available at these links for after the workshop if you want to use these as a resource to go around, maybe check what we've done, and play around with things. So I'll just leave this up for a couple of seconds in case you want to take a photo of it before we move on. It's also available as a handout on the talk. So if you have the ISMB app on your phone, there's a, there's a handout that contains these links also. So in terms of the problem we're going to be looking to address, we've, we've tried to pick one that should be familiar to most of you in this room. And that is, can we classify pairs of proteins into their, into their, SCOP, fam, into their SCOP classifications? So for a pair of proteins, are they in the same family? Are they in the same superfamily? Are they in the same fold? In the data set that's been pro that we've provided everybody with, we've got examples of proteins that are, that are in all of these three categories. But for this workshop, we're just going to be focusing on the easiest question of whether or not a given pair of proteins are in the same family as each other. So the data set we're using is the Astral data set. I don't want to go into too much of the details as to what's in here, but just for, for a size guide, there's, a, there's almost 14,000 proteins from over 4,000 folds. So the data set structured that for any target protein, we have a set of template proteins, some of which are and some of which aren't um, in the same family as that protein, and eight pairwise features that are based off the sequences of those two proteins that we're going to be using to try and predict whether or not the template protein is in the same family as the target. Kind of jumping ahead almost to the results, so you, so you know what we're aiming for, um, we decided to use machine learning to try and answer this problem given the feature set we had. Um, kind of a few reasons. Number one, kind of machine learning's hot. Everyone wants to hear about it. <coughs> Secondly, in both of our research during our PhDs, we both use machine learning as our primary kind of toolbox in order to try and solve problems. And I guess thirdly, one of the big criticisms of machine learning is it's much harder to reproduce maybe than other methods. And I guess we want to show that this doesn't have to be the case in all circumstances. So the results that we kind of will be aiming for as kind of follows. So we trained a random forest classifier on a subset of our, of our protein data and tested on a distinct subset and got an accuracy of the, as to whether two proteins are in the same family of around 88%. So in the bottom, you see kind of two graphical ways of displaying the same test results that maybe you'll find in a paper um, or, or a piece of research that you're reading. 
On the left, you've got a confusion matrix. So that plots the predicted classes on the y-axis against the true class labels on the x-axis. So along the diagonals, you see all the, all the predictions that you have got correctly. And on the off-diagonals, you see the predictions that you've got incorrect. So you can see for our random forest, almost all of the samples lie on the di diagonal, and there are very few on the off-diagonals, kind of which is in line with what we'd expect given the accuracy figure we've reported. On the right-hand side, we've got a rock curve, which if you don't know what that is, that plots true positive rate against your false positive rate. So if you had a random classifier classifying these, two, these proteins, you, you, you would get the dotted line from the bottom left to the top right that has an area under the curve of 0.5. Our random forest achieved an area under the curve of 0.95, so you can see it's pretty, much, it's pretty close to the perfect classifier of one. So in the rest of the workshop, Fergus is going to be demonstrating how we can, how we can directly reproduce these, these results using the tools we've described earlier. So we've had a few questions throughout already. If, if anybody does have a quick question, we, we can probably take it now, otherwise we'll probably move on to the demonstration part. Cool. Yeah. I think you're up. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, Fergus. Um, so I think from here on out, uh, the demonstration isn't going to be particularly long, uh, and we do have time at the end both for questions and also if, you, if there's anything that you'd like to know about, for example, how can, how can I visualize something within Jupyter that we haven't presented, we're going to allocate some time at the end so that we can do plenty of that. Okay. So, get out of there. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm actually going to go one step further from using Jupyter Notebooks today and use a piece of software called Jupyter Lab. Um, so Fergus has already, for those of you who haven't encountered Jupyter Notebooks before, Fergus has already demonstrated the basic idea, which is you have a browser-based, cell-based, interactive programming environment which is really cool and really fun for interactive programming, but does have certain limitations. For example, you have one notebook in one window. Um, Fergus demonstrated that you can change the kernel that you use, but overall, your features are quite limited. Um, Jupyter Lab is a project which aims to remedy this to some extent and marries full support for Jupyter Notebooks in a variety of languages with some of the more lightweight features that you might encounter in your IDE of choice. For example, PyCharm for Python, RStudio for R, etc., etc. Um, one of these, probably the most useful of the lot, is a simple file browser. You'd be amazed how annoying it is not having a simple file browser on the side of your Jupyter Notebook JupyterLab solves this for you. Um, I'm not going to go into this in more detail today because we're not going to use any of it, um, but you also have available to you, for example, a command console and an IPython terminal if you want to do something a little more hacky directly on a command line. Um, and what's really cool about JupyterLab is if I want to create a new notebook and I want to use a different kernel, it will display all of the kernels that I currently have installed. And to, for Python, R, and also Julia, all you need to do to make that avail to make an installation of that available to Jupyter Lab is to install the appropriate plugin for that language for that installation. And for Python, Conda can handle this for you. The instructions in the README on GitHub explain exactly how to do this. Um, so you can see here I have many Python kernels and also an R kernel. So if I want to change kernel, create a new notebook, I can just select the one I want and I'm good to go. Um, but for today, we're going to use a single kernel and a single notebook. Uh, and I'm going to be using the Conda environment, which we provided as part of the resources that we distributed earlier. Um, there's a YML file available on GitHub and in the archive on the download link, which you can use with Conda, instructions are in the readme, to create exactly the same environment that I'm going to be working in today. Um, and it's quite a bare bones environment. We're not actually going to use much for this demonstration. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is my entire screen is full of markdown. Um, and this is one of the really cool things that Fergus alluded to, is that it's very, very easy to document and present your work just by writing a few markdown cells explaining what's going on. It's much easier on the eye than just using comments and doc string. So to get started, I'm just going to import a few libraries that I'm going to use. Um, and much like running any Python code, once you import something, until you reset the kernel, it's available to you for the entire IPython session. Um, I'm also going to use an example of what's known as IPython, or now Jupyter, inline magic. Um, and these are commands specified by this percent sign. And what we're doing here is simply setting it up so the matplotlib, uh, excuse me, matplotlib's procedural API can directly display figures that it generates without the need to call plot show. It, it saves time when you're 
playing with your data. So one of the questions that is often asked by somebody who's new to IPython and Jupyter more generally is, I already have some code that I've written, or somebody sent me some code, or we're, we've written some code, do I have to copy and paste it into a cell in my notebook in order to use it? Say I have my favorite plotting function. No, you don't. If your code is living in a Python file, you can import it exactly as you would a Python module normally. So for this workshop, we've got some code, I realize the zoom on the screen is not going to make that very readable, but we've got some code that we've written to speed up our plotting just so it doesn't clutter the notebook. Nobody wants matplotlib boilerplate in their notebook. So get out of here. So, and you can also get out of here. So all I have to do is import it as a module, exactly as normal, and now I have all of those commands available to me for the entire of the notebook. Another thing you can do, rather than importing it as a module, is another piece of inline magic, which is known as the run command. And if I execute the run command on a file, what it will do is it will implicitly import all of that code into that cell and run it as if that code lived in that cell um, without explicitly rendering it in the notebook to keep things nice and tidy. This is another option you have available to you. Um, finally, suppose you want to inspect the code. You want to play with it. You want to modify it. Maybe you want to make it look a little bit prettier for the notebook without changing the main file. I can use the load command to load the entire contents of the file into my notebook. <coughs> and from here, if I wanted, maybe I want to change the format for the notebook, maybe I want to make the figures look a little different, I can modify the code and execute that cell and use it within the notebook as is without changing the main file. So this is a really cool feature. Um, and something that's really cool is because this environment is built on the IPython kernel, if you're familiar with IPython, um, it provides a lot of interactive commands which you can use to play with your code from the command line. Um, you have all of the usual IPython commands available to you. So for example, I can inspect the documentation and call signature of the function we're going to use to plot the confusion matrix that I imported earlier, exactly as I would in IPython. And you can see its output below my cell, call signature, and all of the documentation, and even where the file, whence it came, is located. And that can be really nice if someone sends you, you some code, you want to apply it, but you don't want to delve into the belly of the beast and figure out exactly how everything works and how it's all tied together. Okay, so we're running a little behind because we took so many questions earlier, which was really good. Um, but I'm going to just zoom straight ahead to solving the actual problem for now, and then we can maybe do some more cool Jupyter stuff towards the end. Okay, so I'm going to be working with the data set Fergus mentioned earlier. Um, and one of the really nice things about this sort of environment is it enables you to load your data in and look at your data and play with it, just get a feel for what it actually looks like all within this sort of an interactive environment. So to do this, I'm gonna load my data into a data frame using the library pandas. For those of you not, not familiar with Python, but familiar with R, it provides the same sort of functionality as R's data frames, allowing you to load your data into a nice formatted table, manipulate it, query it like a database, and so on. Um, and Jupyter renders pandas data frames very nicely. So if I output a pandas data frame from a cell, in this case I'm just looking at the first five lines, it will render it in HTML as a nice table. So if someone sent me the data, I can have a look at it. I've got names of my target and template proteins, I've got columns containing all of my computed features, and I've also got a class label assigned to the protein, to the, to the pair. In this case, these are all examples of templates and targets belonging to the same family. And so just like that, I can look at exactly what my data looks like. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of data processing. I'm not gonna go into the details because this is just a toy problem. Um, what we're doing is we're going to select from the total set of the data, a subset of the proteins belonging to a cluster within which each protein is the me a member of the same family as at least one other protein. So for every protein, there will be, for every protein target, there will be examples of templates belonging to the same family and every protein, every protein will be a viable template for at least one other member of, of the cluster. Okay, I'm also gonna do a little bit of pre-processing, made nice and easy using pandas, and I spent a lot of time playing with this in the interactive environment. And all I'm gonna do is drop rows where the target and template pair are duplicated. It turns out there's some noise in the data where there's some confusion as to whether or not certain pairs are in the same family or super family. You can play around with Jupyter to visualize that, drop it, and move on. Okay, and so t just to illustrate how 
this sort of environment makes it really easy to visualize your code and your workflow and really explore your data. I'm going to create a nice file pot. I'm actually going to make that a little bit smaller because of how magnified the screen is. So what I'm going to do is, for the subset of the data I've selected, I'm going to plot the number of examples of target template pairs which belong to the same family, the same super family, the same fold, or are completely unrelated. They have the label random. And what we can see is that the number of examples belonging to the same family or unrelated is much smaller than that belonging to the same super family or fold. This kind of makes sense when we think about what's in the data. Um, so for the purpose of this toy problem, I'm going to restrict myself to just determining whether or not two examples belong to the same family or not. So I'm going to select the subset of the data with labels either family <coughs> or random. It turns out predicting super family and fold is a much trickier problem, and we don't want to look at that right now because it's hard. <laughs> Um, and so as a sanity check, after I've done that, I'm going to create exactly the same plot of my new data frame just to confirm that I've selected what I think I have, and I have. And this makes it really quick and really easy to sanity check your code as you're going along without constantly writing your Python file, going to another terminal, running it, you know, or creating a plot in an IPython window, whatever you do. Um, it really speeds things up. Um, so that's all the pre-processing of the data I'm going to do. So there's really not much to it. Um, so I'm going to move straight on to setting up my machine learning workflow. And the first thing I'm going to do is split my data into training and test sets. And this is a really critical part of quality reproducible machine learning research. Um, and if you've ever tried to reproduce a machine learning paper where they don't explicitly specify exactly how they split their data, you can find that it's very easy to get leakage of information between what you think the training and test set is and what it actually was, and that is very annoying. So to make sure I know exactly what, not only exactly what I'm using, but that everyone else knows exactly what I'm using and can select exactly what I'm using, I'm going to explicitly specify the seed of the random number generator I'm going to use to split my data and undersample my data. So of the approximately 10,000 proteins belonging to this cluster, I'm going to select 5,000 just to speed up training for the purposes of the workshop, but you could also imagine you want to split your data into different folds to do different things. I'm going to do this randomly, and I'm going to split them by the protein target, just because this is a more realistic assessment of how you might do this problem. You have an unseen target, a bunch of plausible templates. You've never seen that target before. You want to know if anything is in the same family without having trained on it. Um, so I'm going to split this in an 80-20 ratio. So 80% of my 5,000 protein targets will form my training set. 20% will form my test set. Um, and so something that I actually want to point out here, I realize that in order to scale this up for the screen, some bits of lines have been cut off. One of the things I'm doing here, whenever I manipulate a data frame or create a new data frame, is I'm explicitly creating copies of everything. This is not, some, not, not normally something you would worry about if you were just writing a Python script to form part of a pipeline, because you would run it once, and that's that. But in this sort of interactive environment, where you can jump back and forth, so I can zoom up here, recreate my plot, for example, re-execute the code, even though it's been run previously, it's very easy to take an original data frame or array or whatever, modify it thinking that's what you want, and then realize, actually, I want to modify it in a slightly different way. Now, if you, if you modify it in place, so you modify the original array, go back to your previous piece of code, tweak it again, you won't be making that different change based off of the original state of the data. You'll be making it off of what you've already modified. And that sort of error can be really, really tricky to debug in an interactive environment like this. So a really good practice to get into is making sure you're copying these things whenever you manipulate your data. Um, and again, if you think that might be an issue, you can always write a markdown cell just to explain what you've done and why you've done it. OK? So this is just a little bit of boilerplate to split to select from the, from the data frames the proteins that are going to belong to the training and test set. We don't need to talk about that piece of code. Um, it's not very exciting. It's not very well written. Um, but as another sanity check, what I'm going to do is reproduce the plots I created earlier, <coughs> illustrating the numbers of examples of each class belonging to my training and my test set. But I do apologize for the scaling on the screen. Um, we had to do a bit of a workaround because my laptop wouldn't mirror to the display for some reason. Um, on the left side plot here, and I really do apologize that you can't see everything properly. Um, on the left side, I've, made the, I've produced this plot for my training data, which is approximately 80% of all of my targets. On the right hand <coughs> side, I've produced the plot for my test data, which is approximately 20% of all of my targets. And if you look at the scales along the y axis, you can see that the numbers are approximately, 
excuse me, approximately what you would expect for that split. And you can see that the sort of distribution between the two has been more or less reproduced equally between the two splits, which is nice. It means we've actually split our data correctly. And it, it, this sounds trivial, but one of the nice things about this sort of environment is it's really easy to do these checks. And you can document what you've done, what it shows, and why. It's really cool. Um, but that's that. Again, it's a simple problem. So I'm sorry, did you? Yes, so, um, so I don't have an example of this here. Um, I'm happy to talk to you more about this afterwards because there's all sorts you can do. One of the things that I did do when playing with this was the problem of predicting superfamily fault. The only reason it's not in here is because I think it's more beneficial to focus on the tool than the problem. Um, but in that scenario, because you have far more fault examples and superfamily examples, what I did was undersample those. So I got the size of the smallest class and randomly selected that number of examples from all the other classes. There are other ways of doing it, some algorithm specific, some independent. If you want to talk about this, by all means. Um, but for, the, for this problem, because the classes are almost balanced, I didn't bother doing anything. <coughs> they're, they're slightly different. It probably doesn't matter. Um, so the first thing we think is, OK, everyone uses random forests because they just work most of the time. Um, not always the best, but they do just work. So I thought, train a random forest classifier to do this using my training data. Um, I haven't really bothered setting hyperparameters because random forest tends to be very robust with respect to that. But what you can see here is I have explicitly set my random generator seed once again. Um, for, again, for, for two reasons. One, random forests are stochastic algorithms, and therefore, if you run two replicates with different seeds, there's no guarantee the model will be identical. And two, as we discussed before, I don't want to worry about setting my random seed once, executing cells in weird orders, and losing track of what the seed actually is versus what I think it is. So when in doubt, there's no reason not to approach it like this. Um, and so it trained super quick, partly because I was lazy and undersampled the data for speed. Um, and so we can immediately just compute the accuracy score of that random forest classifier on our test data. And you see we've achieved an accuracy score of 88%, which if you recall from Fergus's presentation, is the sort of number we were looking at in, the, in our final results. Um, but that's not very satisfying. Um, and especially if you had a class imbalance scenario, that's completely unsatisfying. So what we can instead look at is some nice ways of visualizing the data. So the first thing I'm going to do is reproduce the confusion matrix from Fergus's presentation. I'm going to use the code for the confusion matrix plotting, which I imported earlier. I haven't written anything in here to plot the confusion matrix. I'm just going to use that code. And there we go. Get that in the center there. And so I'm not going to ask you to recall the numbers, but if you recall from the presentation, we classified the vast majority of examples correctly in both the random and same family case. Um, so you can imagine a perfect confusion matrix would have zero values in all of the off diagonals. You can extend this to any number of classes. And the full number of each example of examples for that class in the on diagonals. So I think we've done reasonably well here. Um, and, that is, and that is exactly the figure that Fergus showed to you earlier. So random forest works really well. Suppose my colleague suggests to me, hey, why don't you try something else? I think logistic regression would work really well for this problem. OK, why not? Um, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing here. I'm going to train a logistic regression classifier. Once again, I'm going to specify my random seed just because I want to know exactly what it is and not just guess at what it is. So I'm going to train that, compute the accuracy score on my test data. You get an accuracy score of just under 0.85. Not quite as good as the random forest, so we could start thinking about why that is. Um, but we'll come back to that in just one moment. First, I'm going to use the plotting code that I showed you earlier to reproduce the rock curve that Fergus showed you during his presentation. Once again, I'm not doing any particular plotting in this cell. All the code is in the code that I imported. I'm just going to call the function, pass it my predictions. <coughs> I have no idea why the legend is there. Let me, I'm good. <laughs> I have not reproduced the plot. Um, uh, matplotlib, ladies and gentlemen, matplotlib. Um, Actually, it, it might, I, I think I know what the issue is. Let's make the figure a bit bigger. Can we, can we reproduce a rock curve? Yes, they're where they should be. So I, I last minute changed the scaling so that everything rendered well when we blew up the screen again because couldn't get it to mirror properly. Blame NVIDIA and Ubuntu. Um, so what you see here is the blue line shows the rock curve for that random forest classifier, which as Fergus showed you, achieved an AUC of 0.95, so not 
bad, I guess. Um, and this is exactly the figure that Fergus showed you in his presentation. Now, we have a bit more time so we can think about why did our logistic regression do worse? It could just be that random forest is better suited to this problem, but we can do better than that. And we can use this nice interactive environment to do that exploration. First, what I'm going to do is go in, modify this cell, re-execute it to add the curve for the logistic regression predictions to my figure. And so the blue line for the, for the random forest is unchanged, but I've now added a green line for my logistic regression. And we can see that we've achieved an AUC of just under 0.91. So both in terms of accuracy and in terms of what might be a better <coughs> metric for classification, we can see that we are definitely worse than the random forest. Okay, and we didn't have to write, and we didn't have to write much extra code, we just modified the cell and re-executed it. Again, it just makes it really nice and easy to explore your data and do quick, rapid prototyping typing of a method. And you can always go back, write Markdown later to formalize it, get it ready to send it out to a collaborator. Um, one of the things that I didn't do before training for logistic regression was standardize my data. And by that I mean scale my data to ensure that they all have zero mean and the same variance and the same range of values. Random forest is not sensitive to this by the nature of the algorithm, but logistic regression and many other algorithms are. You can imagine if I have two features, one takes values zero to one and the other takes values zero to 10 million, they have the same shape of distribution, but one has far larger absolute values of variance than the other. If you have an algorithm which depends on variance in any way, for example, PCA, support vector machines, logistic regression, they will be sensitive to that. And they will be, their training, for better or worse, will be dominated by that one figure, with, by that one feature with the larger variance. So again, I can just, I can test my hypothesis for why the logistic regression did worse. Just, I'm gonna create a new cell. I'm gonna use um, something from the machine learning API, scikit-learn, to standardize my data. All sorts of ways of doing it. I'm gonna train a new logistic regression by fitting a transformation on my training data applying that transformation to both my training and test data to ensure knowledge of my test data doesn't leak into my training in any way. Training new logistic regression. Well, retrain the same logistic regression, technically. And we can see that our accuracy score has bumped up from just below 80, 0.85 to 0.856. I mean, it's <coughs> not a particularly big increase, but there is a non-zero effect. So something seems to have happened there. We can also go, at, go back to our rock curve, add a new curve for our new logistic regression trained with scaled data and tested on scaled data. So even if you run it below, you can still Yes, it exactly. So what you can see here is, and so I'll come out to address that because that's actually something I find really cool, is I've added the third rock curve. It's in the red. It lies somewhere between the random forest, the best model, and the logistic regression with the unscaled data, the worst model. And so, yes, that's a really good point, something I find really cool. You can imagine if you sent this to a collaborator and everything's in a weird order, they'll look at it and say, what the hell's going on here? I don't want to read this, what, what, what's going on? Even if you draw nice arrows to say, run this, then this, then this, then this, get out of here, rewrite it. But what you can imagine is you can quickly rapid prototype as you generate new hypotheses and want to test them. And then all of your code is encapsulated in cells, you can copy, paste, rearrange, dump to files, load from files, put it wherever you want without rewriting that code one block at a time, test it as you go on, get it in the order you want, add some markdown cells around it to document exactly what you've done, tweak your figures to make them publication ready, send it off to your collaborator without having to rewrite anything, you know, create a bunch of new files, save a bunch of figures. And that, I think, is one of the real powers of this sort of interactive environment. So. We have about 10 minutes left. So there's a couple of other things I want to show you, but then I'd like to open the floor to questions, both about what we've done, and also if there's anything you feel I haven't shown and would like to see. So one thing I want to show you is just very quickly, you can see that we've made some changes to this notebook. When I started, these figures weren't displayed, and now they are. What's really cool about the Jupyter Notebook is it doesn't just save what you've written in your cells. It also saves the output. So th these outputs are living in essentially another cell. I, I can't modify it from the notebook, but it's effectively another cell. In fact, if you look at the, H the HTML and Markdown, th there will be HTML describing how to render that figure. So something really cool about this is I can actually type 
while looking back and forth between this and my computer, um, is I'm just going to quickly blow this up to make sure you can all see it reasonably well. So I'm going to, I have this, I have all of this work sitting in a Git repository, repository on my laptop under version control. And as we mentioned earlier, there's a GitHub repo. I have that linked to this repository. So what I can do is I can make those changes to my Git repository on my laptop. There we go. So what I've done there is I've added the changes to the repository. At that point, it isn't actually set in stone. So you can add changes, revert changes, add changes, revert changes. Once you're satisfied with your work for the day, what I've done now is what's known as committing the changes. That's updated the repository. There's now a new step in the history saying what's been changed and added a nice message saying what was committed in that change. And so that's now, all those changes are now version controlled on my laptop. I'm gonna go one step further and push those changes to the remote copy on GitHub. Please do not hack my GitHub. <laughs> it's fine, everything on there is crap anyway. Apart from the plotting code, I like the plotting code. Okay, so what I've now done is push those changes to the notebook on the GitHub. If you looked at the GitHub previously, if you look at it again, you'll now see all of the output from all of those cells in the notebook. Get out of here. What I can now do Go on to the GitHub repo, go into the folder, open the notebook. GitHub wasn't rendering it yesterday. Let's see if it's gonna render it today. Yes, so GitHub <coughs> is, integrates really, really well with Jupyter Notebooks and it renders the HTML really nicely. In some cases, I feel it actually renders it better. So you can see this code that I imported wasn't originally there. It's been updated on GitHub. Let's scroll down here. It renders the table, the pandas data frame quite nicely. It renders my figures quite nicely. There's all my figures, there's all my figures, there's all my figures. There's the final rock curve. And so what's really cool about this is even though we haven't gone through, refactored it, tidied it up, made it pretty, if I've got a proof of concept, I can push it to GitHub, send a link to the GitHub repo to a collaborator. They don't have to download anything, they don't have to run anything, they don't even have to read a lengthy PDF that I've sent them that nobody wants to read anyway. All they have to do is look at this on the GitHub repo, understand what I've done, and look at all of my figures, and they can save those figures if they want, they can send it off to somebody else who might be interested. I just want to show you one final tool which can further aid collaboration, and that is a website called NB Viewer. Um, and this is a tool provided by Project Jupyter. Um, it's open source, the source code for MB Viewer is on GitHub, it's all, it's all one big circle, cycle of life. Um, what you can do is, for example, provide a GitHub URL for where a notebook lives, enter into MB Viewer, and it will render everything even more nicely than GitHub does. And so if you really want to go the extra mile and impress your collaborator, or show off, um, but none of us do that here. We're all very humble scientists. You can send, instead send them to NB Viewer, send them the notebook in NB Viewer, and they can see exactly what you've done, forward it to their collaborators, share it. And then if you've made the GitHub repo public, they can download the code from GitHub, they can use Git to clone it so that it's automatically under version control on their computer, and they can play with what you've done exactly as you've done it. And if you also send them the details of how to create the Conda environment, like I did, they can set that up and know that they're running the code with exactly the same packages, exactly the same environment that you use. And there is absolutely no fear that it will interfere with their existing Python installations. And so I think that just about wraps up the demonstration that we planned to do. Um, we have a few more minutes left to either take questions or for me to show you more cool stuff if that's what you want. So I'm gonna just go back to the slides, just remind you of the figures that we correctly reproduced. And I'd just like to finish, first of all, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to thank Dr. Salo de Oliveira, who's a recently graduated postdoc of the Dean Group in Oxford. And he provided us with the data set, the computed features, and really helped us get to grips with the problem and what might be an interesting problem to show you all today. And without him, none of this would have happened. Well, it would, but I would have shown you boring small molecule stuff and nobody likes that. 
Secondly, I'd like... <laughs> I have to pretend I do. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank Professor Charlotte Dean here, um, who has been the victim of our early renditions of this workshop and uh, encouraged us to do this, helped to arrange for us to do this, and again, without whom this would not be happening. I'd like to thank IS ISCB and the organizers of 3D SIG for enabling us to come here and present this to you today. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. I'd like to thank my glamorous assistant. And finally, I, we didn't put a full list of everyone we want to acknowledge. I'd like to thank the rest of the Dean group, Oxford Protein Informatics group, who also suffered through the early renditions of this presentation and gave us feedback very brutally. So, thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, thanks, for, thanks for a nice demo. And um, one, one thing you alluded to at the end of the talk is that someone else could, could uh, exactly reproduce the, the notebook. Um, I, one, one issue of, one difficulty I've had with that is getting the exact same versions of all of the Python libraries that I might use in my notebook. And can you, can you give uh, advice on how to make sure that your collaborator gets the exact versions that you yes. use? Yes, yes I can. Okay. So what I will do is I will show you the environment file that we distributed, which you can use to create the condo environment. Can you, let me blow that up a little bit. I think it's in this folder. Yes, it is. Okay, so the condo environment that we created lives in a file, fergalicious.yml. And so what this specifies is the name of the condo environment that you're going to create, any channels, and it's basically just online repositories of where packages live from which you should tell condo to preferentially source the packages, in this case I'm using Condaforge, which is an open community platform for providing build recipes for different Python libraries. It's a really fantastic resource. Um, and then you can provide, for example, the exact Python version, 3.6, because for, for God's sake, it's been out for ages, just update already. Um, and the names of the packages which I use. For the purposes of the workshop, I didn't specify the package versions. As long as they're all reasonably up to date, everything will be touch wood, there's no wood here, touch wood, fine. But what you can certainly do is, if you have a specific version in mind, uh, I can't remember the exact syntax off the top of my head, um, you can specify the precise version that you want. So say I want NumPy, I don't know, version 1.12.0. I can specify that. And if you know, so for example, I'm using a very recent version of Pandas. They updated the API recently. Some things will break if you use a version from three months ago, as Fergus found out once. Uh, <laughs> that was a fun day. Um, if you think that's going to be an issue, or just for good practice, you should probably specify this anyway if you're really releasing the final version. You can get the list of exactly what's in your condo environment and enter it into the file. Or, I don't think we have time to go through all, all of this, that you can find the documentation online, it's really good. You can export an automatically generated YML environment file from your Conda environment using Conda, and it will list exactly what you need with the exact versions. So yes, you can distribute the exact environment that you used. Okay, yes, thank you. 